Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, as always. Thank you so much for listening, for taking the time to listen, and also thank you for supporting the Jefferson Hour. You can do so at the website, jeffersonhour.com. Um, if you want to give us financial support, we really appreciate it. And if you want to just email us and send a question for Clay or Jefferson or just make a comment about the show, good or bad, and that kind of support we really appreciate as well. So this week, <laughs> this is a great one, um, Clay and Lindsay Chervinsky uh, talked about the election of 1800 and the, the near end of America in 1800. It was a great conversation, Clay. You couldn't be more right, David. Um, The near end of America. I mean, so Washington is unanimously elected president, um, Adams vice president. He serves two terms. Then Adams becomes president. It wasn't unanimous, but it was solid. He called himself the heir apparent, which is a little funny. Uh, Then in 1800, it's the first real contest between the two parties, the emerging small R Republican Party and the emerging Federalist Party. Uh, There were no conventions, but there were kind of very low-level caucuses. And Jefferson is the Republican candidate, and the incumbent Adams is the Federalist candidate. And so Jefferson wins. It's the first transfer of power in our constitutional system from one party to another. And you know that great letter that Margaret Bayard Smith wrote about. She said, In most of these cases, this is attended with civil disruption and violence and riots in the streets and so on. And then she coined the phrase that you and I love to quote, but in this our happy republic, in this our happy republic, uh, we transfer power without any mayhem or chaos. And we all thought that that was it, that that was America. And now we're not as sure, given the events of the last couple of years and what might be coming in 2024, so it's an important program, but it reminds you, this is something that it, it, I thought of you throughout, David, because you're when I'm talking, when I get wound up about stuff, you always say, oh, come on, we've been there before, we've seen this before, come on. And you remind me that our history is, has more continuity. Yeah, than... I'm slipping a little bit from that, as you can tell. <laughs> I, I hate to see you lose that. You were, you yeah. were my reality check, but it is true that if you want to see chaos, you don't have to go to 2020 to see chaos. Go to 1800 when Hamilton writes a nasty pamphlet about the Federalist leader, Adams, when Burr is outmaneuvering uh, Hamilton in New York. Burr actually put mattresses all over his living room floor so that his his campaign guys could come and get a few uh, hours oh, of sleep. I didn't know that. Where did you find that? It's, it's, all in, it's all in these books, and he's catering for them. They're going door to door. They're doing retail politics at a time when People of that status wouldn't do that sort of thing. Hamilton is appalled, but he knows he's been bested. It has to do with the emerging Republican press because printing presses are becoming cheap enough that you can get one. And so the Federalists owned the presses until the election of 1800 when suddenly they got blindsided by these new Republican printing presses. Same thing kind of happened with Barack Obama. He used the internet at a time when it wasn't yet the way to do stuff like this. And Trump used Twitter at a time when it wasn't yet regarded as one of the paths. So, you know, using emerging technology. And and Jefferson Jefferson was dead, according to one newspaper. Listen, we've been admonished for the length of last Who admonishes us? For the the length of last week's podcast. Do we get complaints about this? So, no, let's go to the show. But before we do... Um, something that came up uh, in a previous broadcast. You're real excited because you've got a trip to Greece coming up. Yes. Uh, September so 15th through Tell 20- us about that and we'll go to the show. September 15th through 23rd, 2023. So next year, September 15th through 23rd, Greece, Homer. Uh, we're going to Delphi. We're going to Nauplion. We're going to Mycenae. We're going to Epidaurus. We're going to Santorini, the greatest, most beautiful island in the world. Um, and of course, we'll be in Athens. And so it's a you know, eight day trip next year in the fall and the fall after that, 2024, back to France for our fourth France trip. And this summer, July 31st through August 9th, the Salmon River trip, it's Lewis and Clark, but it's Lewis and Clark on the Salmon, not Lewis and Clark as they want, eventually wound up on the Columbia. So all that's coming, David. Let's go to the show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Good day, citizens. 
and welcome to this week's episode of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm your host, David Swenson, joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and one of our favorite contributors and guests. I hesitate to even call you a guest anymore, Lindsay, but Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky. And oh my, the two of you have picked a very interesting subject for this week's discussion, something that's been talked about and written about by many. That would be the election of 1800. And let's get right to it. And I I would like to start with a quote from Susan Dunn's book, Jefferson's Second Revolution. She opens with a quote from the Connecticut Current in the fall of 1800, reporting, quote, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will all be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of distress, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crime. So before we start, perhaps the two of you can set our listeners up and and tell them what was going on in the election of 1800. So, Lindsay, did Jefferson bring on a reign of terror? <laughs> no, he did not. Although I will say the embargo was kind of an economic terror. That didn't go very well. But it was not the reign of terror that was predicted in the 1790s. There was no Bible theft. There was no Bible destruction. There were none of those things. So uh, those very uh, pressing concerns did not come to be. No fires in the streets, no uh, armed gangs, no guillotine, and um, no confiscation of sacred texts. Uh, Jefferson didn't even fulfill the Federalist nightmare of um, cashiering all Federalist office holders. Uh, He uh, kept many. Uh, He had a pretty, I think, intelligent system of deciding who was a diehard and who was um, maneuverable. And he also... um, defied the Federalist anxiety that he would repudiate Hamilton's economic system. He kept the bank. He tried to chasten it a little bit, but he did not bring about even a policy revolution. He did not. So to set up this uh, very important and historic election, the 1790s were a period of intense anxiety and strife. There was a great deal of concern about whether or not the nation would survive, which I think we treat those concerns as trivial at our peril. We know that the nation survived. We know that this experiment continued. They did not have that foresight. They did not know that that was going to happen. And so they were desperately concerned that would this transition, would this election prove to be the nation's undoing? And they had fairly decent reason to be concerned. The most recent transition they had observed was the French Revolution, which was characterized by guillotine and blood running through the streets. So they were very worried about whether or not the nation would survive. Both sides thought the other was a mortal threat. Both sides thought that any and almost all measures were appropriate to combat that threat. When we talk about nasty elections today, they certainly gave us a run for their money. Federalists suggested that that Jefferson would destroy their Bibles and lead to anarchy. Jeffersonians suggested that Adams would be controlled by his wife and had a hermaphroditic character, which meant that he had no principles. And so when we think about the worst and most important elections, certainly this has to be towards the top of the list. Let me ask a question about this. So you say we need to take seriously the the sense that everything was at stake and that the, we, the country might collapse. I agree with that. What about this? I think even though I'm a Jeffersonian, rational and reasonable men and women had reasons to be concerned about the election of a man like Thomas Jefferson. So far as his principles were known, and they weren't particularly well known, he was seen as a Democrat, as a small-D Democrat, and someone who was um, insufficiently aware of economic realities of a new nation and committed to his sort of Virgilian notion of the family farm and so on, and that he had spent maybe too much time in France. Uh, is is it fair to say that that it doesn't wasn't just paranoia on the side of of the usual political pundits, but there was reasonable concern about what Jefferson would come to represent? Absolutely, and compounding that fear was an uncertainty about what would happen to the federal government, which was still viewed as fairly fragile. 
if a new party came in, replaced a bunch of people, maybe tried to reduce or destroy some of the institutions or some of the practices, the country had never experienced that. And so there was a real sense of uncertainty about would it actually work? Would that process of transitioning from one party to the other, even if Jefferson was more perhaps moderate than some of the people anticipated, would that change destroy everything? And those were, I think, very fair concerns because that was a relatively unprecedented practice in human history. It's not that slavery didn't come up in the election of 1800 because there were Northerners who said, who is this slave owner and the three-fifths clause, the Negro president, I'm using air quotes, um, et cetera, could not be elected without the three-fifths clause and so on. But it wasn't a make or break issue in 1800. That's right. I mean, it was always sort of on the outskirts of discussion, as you mentioned, with the concept of representation and one of the big concerns that Southerners had about Northern candidates and federal power was at what point would that federal power be turned on the institution of slavery? There was always this sense that that was inevitable. And so it was certainly in the back of people's minds. It was on the fringes of conversation, but it was not a central issue. Disappointing, but true. Yes. So we look at this election of 1800. The United States had gained its independence. We had sort of a glow period uh, with uh, George Washington as first president, then into Adams. And then all of a sudden, 1800, things become extremely contentious. Uh, Clay, one of your points is you you call this one of the most vituperative elections in American history. Um, and you've already made that point. Do you want to dwell on that for a moment? Well, only in this sense, and I'm echoing something that Dr. Chavinsky has already said, which is that we think we live in this uniquely partisan and paralyzed and uh, angry time. It is bad. And I believe the future of the republic is in jeopardy. But we've been here before. And if you ever, if you want to have any other election which sort of raises this set of issues, and early on, it's the election of 1800 where both sides felt that everything was at stake, uh, where the anger and the vitriol and the innuendo and the ad hominem attacks and the mischaracter and deliberate mischaracterizations of the other's point of view, the hiring of, of, of uh, journalist hacks, uh, to attack the other people. This was really tough stuff. And both sides did it. And Jefferson, I'm sorry to say, although he likes to present himself as above all of that, was not above all of that. And he slyly did what he could to encourage others, including James Callender, to write dirt on his old and trusted friend, James Madison. And in our time, say the election of Ronald Reagan or the election of George W. Bush or the the election of Barack Obama, whatever the rhetoric, we all sort of knew the future of our system is not at stake. We may disagree with what's coming, but, but the system is strong. I think today, in 2016, 2020, and 24, that's no longer guaranteed. I think we have legitimate concerns. But, Lindsay, the election of 1800 was amongst the most vituperative in American history, by no means unique, but but certainly it's sort of the, the exemplum of what can go wrong. It was. And one of the real characteristics that you mentioned is a lack of journalistic ethics. So at the time, there were intense partisan presses. But I think what, what is sort of different from our moment is everyone at the time understood that the presses were partisan. There had never been a concept of journalistic ethos or journalism as a profession. So that was sort of the understood practice with newspapers. Whereas today, I think we're still really struggling because there was a period of time starting in sort of the 1890s with muckraking journalism up through the 20th century, where there was this sense that the the calling of journalism was to pursue a higher truth and to uncover wrongdoing and to put forth sort of you know, unobjectionable facts. And so we're still struggling today because we want that to be the mode, but the journalistic scaffolding that we're operating under is no longer that of like the 1960s when there were three television channels and you could trust sort of the anchors that you saw in front of you. Today, we're dealing with a media landscape that is actually much more similar to that of the 1790s. We just haven't quite caught up yet in terms of our understanding. 
before you were born, um, I'm sorry to say, since you are a mere sprite, um, Walter Cronkite, the CBS news anchor, was routinely um, named as the most trusted man in America. It's hard to think of anyone in the news business today who could ever win that award on any side, even if you take ABC and and CBS or N- NPR, even the ones that are trying still to be objective and to present the news and to be as truthful as they know how to be, and to really fact and to really self question their their prejudices. Nobody today w- would 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 believe that. But back in Jefferson's time, the newspapers were openly partisan. There was no th- threat of objectivity. They were they were rags for a cause. And so, as you say, everybody knew it, and so nobody was calling them to a higher standard. Well, th- that's true in the sense that, you know, there were three networks. It, it, those of us who were uh, lucky enough to be alive and sit in front of the television set and watch Walter Cronkite remember that. But at the same time, during the election of 1800, everything was written. It, was, it wasn't personalities. It was all published works and opinions. Yeah, mostly, except for preachers, and often they were partisan, and the pulpits were used for a whole variety of purposes, local news, gossip, announcements, etc., and many of the clergy, especially in New England, were openly partisan. But it's true, Lindsay, that most things then circulating as media were written. That's true, although that suggests that one cannot have a lot of personality in writing, and I think that that is not quite so. So there were particular editors that were known for their... Extremism is sort of a difficult word because of 21st century connotations, but they were known for their flamboyance in their arguments. So Benjamin Franklin Bosch, who was the editor of the Aurora, was one of the pro-Jefferson newspapers. Uh, William Cobbett was the editor of the Porcupine Gazette. And I mean, they were just outrageous and they just lied. They lied and they were so colorful in their lies that they kind of became this very exciting person to follow. But if your newspaper's called The Porcupine, you've already sort of let people know what's coming. It's true. It wasn't particularly subtle. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, a 10 Things discussion about the election of 1800. And both of you have agreed that this was one of the most contentious and dangerous elections in American history. But I wanted to center a bit on Jefferson and Adams, the two contenders in this election. They were friends, but that didn't save the troubles of this election, did it? No. You know, David, you're such a soft-hearted person. I know you love Adams, and you always want to talk about friendship and harmony and so on. But they were friends. Well, where did I get that from? They were. Excuse me? They were very close (laughs) friends. And I think it broke Adams' heart, certainly. And Jefferson's to a certain degree that this was one of the casualties of the politics of the 1790s. It wasn't particularly about the election of 1800. But by now, the Adams, as I said in a previous program, had begun to doubt Jefferson because of his support of Shays' Rebellion and his support of the French Reign of Terror. And they they were starting to think, is this this really a reliable person, this Jefferson? And Jefferson saw Adams as a kind of a vain... Um, irascible, frequently irrational, um, mercurial, unreliable kind of person who lacked decorum and and, and self-control in important situations. And Jefferson, I think, believed in some sense that Adams was a monarchist. He knew better, but he, in some sense, he believed that Adams was part of the movement towards monarchy. So there'd been a lot of mutual distrust growing during this period. And it was lucky that the friendship ever came back, Lindsay, that they might easily have never talked to each other again. Turns out that Dr. Rush put them back together. That's true. So they met in the Continental Congress. They worked together on the Declaration of Independence. They were both sort of kindred spirits in being at the vanguard for pushing for independence and for that declaration. Adams had been pretty instrumental in getting Jefferson to be the one to sort of write it because he recognized that, A, Jefferson was probably a better writer, and B, Jefferson was less objectionable to more of the people in Congress. Adams had really played a fiery role and so didn't want those personal feelings to get in the way of the success of this document. 
They then met up again and sort of resumed this close working relationship in Europe when they were both there as ministers. They really were family during that time because they were one of the few Americans that the other had around. Abigail Adams developed a very warm relationship with Jefferson and sort of welcomed him into their family and continued to exchange correspondence for a very long time. This started to shift a little bit when they both came back from Europe in Washington's administration. And I think the key difference is they both left Europe with very different beliefs about the role of Americans in the global sphere. They both saw Europe as a space that had been corrupted by human sin and greed and um, the desire for power. But Jefferson sort of thought Americans were unique and special and they could avoid that fate. Whereas Adams thought that Americans were just as prone to these things and one really had to guard against them. And that very small difference shaped, I think, their responses to a lot of the things that came next. So I think they were still on fairly good terms for the duration of Washington's presidency. They weren't necessarily together all the time, but I think they still had a respectful relationship. And when Adams and Jefferson were both elected in 1786, of course, Thomas Jefferson was John Adams' vice president. Initially, there was a real rapprochement, and Adams was excited to work with Jefferson. Jefferson was excited that he was not president because whoever was going to be number two was just going to be so in such a rough place. And there seemed to be a moment of goodwill, and unfortunately, it was very short-lived and from that point on, they were not particularly close. And then that relationship only deteriorated in as the election emerged. That was brilliant. I think I really admired your commentary about their time in France, where they were truly a kind of a family. And later, John Adams, when they had reconciled, said, you know, JQ, John Quincy, was almost as much your son as mine back in that time. And Jefferson and Abigail exchanged, I wouldn't say flirtatious letters, but oddly intimate letters where he bought corsets for her and he would talk about he bought that one size maybe it's too small but there are ebbs and flows in these things and they were there was a whole kind of uh, joyous intimacy between all three of them and it then fell apart and so Jefferson was glad to be vice president he didn't want to be president in 1796 or at least he said so and he said famously this will give me philosophic evenings in Pennsylvania and summers at Monticello. So it's a typical Jefferson pose, but I think he meant it. Really, Madison is the culprit here, Lindsay, because Jefferson um, and Adams were talking about maybe in some limited kind of sense a joint command or joint, they would be partners in some sense. And um, Adams uh, encouraged this in a conversation and Jefferson wrote him a letter saying, this sounds kind of good to me. And Maybe we can do this, and I would love to cooperate. You know, we're old friends. We, we really believe in the same republic with just slightly different emphases. And Madison saw a draft of it and said, don't send it. Don't send it. You're going you're gonna to regret it because the time's coming when you're going to have to break with him, and then you'll be held um, as a hypocrite or, or, or held as inconsistent if you, publish, if you send him this letter. I think that's one of the great lost moments in American history, truly. And I think Jefferson had a, had a heart to do this better. And Madison was the partisan who was always pushing Jefferson to be more political. Jefferson loved to be above the fray, loved to talk about, you know, Monticello and the clouds and storms and agriculture. But just one last point. I think the difference between them is 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 pretty major. That is, and you said it so well, Jefferson thought that human nature could park itself in Europe and innocent human beings would people the United States. And Adam said, Are you kidding? Human nature's in those ships, too. You can't leave human nature behind in Europe. Jefferson thought, thought it was all environmental. If you just had better farms and better schools and better government and, and a more rational public, we wouldn't be corrupted by human darkness anymore. And Adam's view was, man, are you naive? Man, are you naive about human nature? Absolutely. And I think I think that, that difference also clouded than how they saw each other because Adam saw Jefferson as this wide-eyed idealist who embraced France long beyond the time he should have and always saw the best in France, even when there was a quasi-war taking place. And Jefferson 
saw Adams as this person who was so committed to central power that he was going to bring monarchy into the United States or he had been corrupted by his time in London. And I think neither really gave each other credit full credit for for actually what they were suggesting. And of course, because one Jefferson then became president, he was actually far more rational than he had let on that he would be. Um, <laughs> and far less cozy. Practical, yeah. practical, not rational, practical. Yes, good correction. Um, and and far less cozy with France than, than perhaps even he had anticipated. But when they finally reconciled in 1812 and began Terry tentatively trying to repair and heal and have a good time in their relationship... Adams was the one who wouldn't let it go. And he said, I was right about the French Revolution and you was wrong. You've got to admit that. I was right and you were wrong. And Jefferson finally throws up his hands and says, you know, you're right. I did mis I did misunderstand what was coming in the reign of terror. But Adams could not leave it alone. He, 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 he couldn't understand himself unless he understood that he had a better and sharper idea about human nature than the people around him. And it turns out in this case, he was right. But it was. I'm surprised that Jefferson stood up for that because as you know, Lindsay, when Jefferson's upset, he doesn't respond. He disappears. Well, let's move back to the election. You know, I, I think most Americans have an understanding now of how uh, presidents are, are nominated. We have primaries, we have conventions. Um, back then it was not that way. And, you know, so we have a situation, I don't know if it's unique in American history, maybe one of you do, but we had a president a sitting president and a sitting vice president uh, that ended up competing in in the presidential election. Has that ever happened before? And and how did that happen this time? I don't believe that a sitting vice president and a president have ever competed against each other. The closest maybe is Taft and Roosevelt. Uh, that's about, I think, as close as you could get. But of course, Roosevelt wasn't in office at the time. And Taft wasn't vice president. But yeah, but remember the Twelfth Amendment fixed this. So before the Twelfth Amendment, uh, the person who got the most number of electoral votes was president. The person who got the second most was vice president. It broke down immediately. So Adams is president, Jefferson is vice president, and it didn't work out. So that was fixed uh, before the eighteen oh four election. And so it, it's a quirk of history, uh, David. But it it does cr it created chaos. It created chaos for a number of different reasons, and eventually led to the crisis of the of the Constitution in the House of Representatives. It might be worth explaining actually how people cast their votes because it was a little bit weird. So under the original terms of the Constitution, each elector was to cast two votes, one for the president and one for the vice president. And there was the stipulation that one of those votes had to be for someone out of the state that they lived in so that you didn't have just like Virginians voting for Virginians and New Yorkers voting for New Yorkers and you wouldn't have chaos. However, as Clay mentioned, they were not on separate ballots. So the way the original system worked is each elector cast two votes. One was for their preferred candidate and one had to be for the person out of state. What that meant was the top two candidates would become a president and vice president. So kind of in practice, it was a vote for a president and a vote for vice president, but they weren't ever on separate ballots and you didn't designate which vote was for which. So what that meant was if all of the electors cast the same votes for the same people, which by 1800 was not all that unusual because the parties had coalesced enough such that they could kind of designate who were their two candidates, you could have a tie. And this was something that they did kind of see coming because in 1796, Alexander Hamilton had actually kind of tried to get the second Federalist candidate, Thomas Pinckney, put ahead of John Adams. So this was not a new concept. This was something that was sort of already percolating in the waters. Nonetheless, they did not really fix it. And in 1800, what happened was, indeed, all of the electors cast their votes, all of the Jeffersonian Republican electors cast their votes for Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, and they had the same number of votes, and John Adams came in third. So under the terms of the Constitution, the election was then thrown to the House of Representatives. So Jefferson and Burr each got 73 electoral votes, uh, Adam 69. So what happened was that there was plan ahead of the election that several people would throw away their vote for vice president for the second person to make sure that Burr didn't get the same number of votes as Jefferson. And something failed in that, and they wound up getting 
an identical number of votes. So they were already trying to maneuver the system. It was a very ham-handed system and inefficient, and it got fixed with the 12th Amendment. Anyway, the point, David, is that when, when all the uh, dust cleared, Adams was out, that's for sure. Jefferson was not necessarily in. He was one of two finalists, both of whom had an identical number of electoral votes, and the Constitution did not recognize that he was clearly meant to be president and Burr was clearly meant to be vice president. The Constitution said, it's a tie. Now what? Well, now what is the House? Well, so, so if the, the House of Representatives was voting on this. They could have legitimately voted to make Burr president or somebody else, for that matter. Um, is this a flaw of the Constitution that you're speaking about? And what what do you think the founders had in mind with respect to this? Well, the, in the Trump crisis, you know, there was talk of getting this into the House. If they could only delay the certification, send it to the House. The House votes by state, and so there are more. <clears throat> excuse me, the House votes by state. There are more Republican red states than there are blue Democrat states. If that had happened, Trump would have won re-election. The Constitution did not specify this, so they have seventy three votes each. It goes to the House of Representatives, as I understand it, Lindsay. The House of Representatives is absolutely free to vote for either one of them or neither. It could vote for John Marshall. It could vote for Samuel Adams if it wanted to. Well, I'm not sure it's a flaw. The founding fathers thought the when when there's a tie, the House will make a mature decision. So, so it is a flaw in the Constitution. Well, I don't think the concept that the House can vote for whoever is the flaw. The flaw was the way that the votes were originally set up to be cast because it made a tie just way too likely. The election getting thrown to the House is supposed to be a relatively rare event in theory. Like ties aren't really supposed to happen all that much. And indeed, the concept that they could vote for anyone was so alive and well that there was actually a Federalist movement initially to try and convince people to throw votes to Adams. So even though he came in third by four votes to try and swing votes to him and therefore throw the election to him, which is, in theory, permissible under the existing terms as they were written. Would have been legitimate. It would have, would have been appalling, but it would have been legitimate, and and that's what the Trump administration, the Trump people, were trying to do in two thousand when he lost the election. They were trying to delay the certification to maybe pass it back to the House in the impasse, and the House then would vote by state. That's how the system was set up, and there were more red states than blue, and so the these conspirators thought that maybe Trump could get a second term by way of the maneuvering it through the House of Representatives. If they had succeeded in that, it would have been legitimate? Is no. that what you're saying? No. So the difference in 2020 is that in order to have that sort of tie, they would have had to throw out legitimate votes. In 1800, no votes were thrown out to get the tie. But once there is a tie, then there's kind of a clean slate. Exactly. But in 1800... No throw out votes were required to get that tie. In 2020, they would have had to get rid of legitimate verified votes in order to have that outcome. Lindsay got it exactly right. In the case of a tie, the House has a clean slate, or did. Now, there have been election laws since then that have, that have tied it more closely to the actual results of the electoral process. But in 1800, if the House had said, we want John Marshall to be president, Everyone would have squawked, but nobody could have said that it's unconstitutional. I've got a number of questions about um, Hamilton and Burr, but uh, before we go to those, um, perhaps in the next segment, um, there were real troubles after this election. How close did the United States come to some type of a civil war in the spring of 1801? I'll go quickly. Not close, but lots of talk of it. I mean, there were real concerns. So there were various states that were sort of beginning to call up their militias in the event that some sort of interference was required, some sort of protection was required. But it was a relatively short period of time because states cast their votes over a very lengthy process. And then those votes were all sent to Washington, D.C., where Congress now was at this point. They were opened, they were read, and then there was a period of time Clay, remind me, I think it was eight days where they cast those ballots. And in those eight days, that's where all of these sort of machinations that we're going to talk more about were happening. And so it was a relatively condensed time where people weren't really sure what was going to happen. And they started to maybe call up some forces. But because there was a fairly quick resolution, it ended up really not coming to anything. 
And they didn't have reliable media. They didn't even have media. And most people were just in the dark about what, what we don't even know what's going on. Three mile per hour world, right? But, but Lindsay, I mean, just quickly before we go to break, Governor James Monroe, one of Jefferson's protégés, began to talk about assembling troops on the border of the District of Columbia and invading the Capitol and taking the election back for Jefferson. If the, the House had thrown it to Byrd, do you think that might have actually happened? Certainly not impossible. It's hard to say because it's counterfactual, but uh, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility. I do, but you know, who, the rhetoric was certainly passionate and extreme. And the point, David, is we came close to national collapse here. We could easily have collapsed um, with the third presidency in American history. Was there any talk of secession amongst the states? Yes, in the North, <laughs> always. <laughs> in the North, there was well, and in the year prior, there was real talk of, I don't know if they were outright saying secession yet, but at some point, we obviously, Clay, you and I will have to do a, a 10 things on the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, because the concept of nullification is a hop, skip and a jump away from secession. And that was just the year prior. And I think there are a lot of, there are some scholars that really feel that that was taking things to the brink. And that was one of the reasons then Jefferson pulled back a little bit in 1800. I'd look forward to that conversation. Meanwhile, we do need to take a short break, but we'll return to this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, a 10 things discussion on the contentious election of 1800. And I said it uh, during our last segment that I wanted to talk a bit about Hamilton and Burr. Jefferson had to make assurances to the Federalists that he wouldn't dismantle all of Hamilton's fiscal system or throw all the Federalist office holders out. He claimed that he made no concessions. Clay, what can you tell us about this? He almost certainly made concessions uh, very vaguely through third and fourth parties. I mean, the question was, the Federalists sort of made it clear, although we're going to hold our nose and let Jefferson be president if he doesn't just wipe away Hamilton's whole fiscal apparatus and toss everybody out and maybe destroy the judiciary, etc. And so Jefferson said he never would go with his hands tied. I'm sure he could make that narrative work for himself. But the fact is that there were discussions and Jefferson must, Lindsay, have said, let him know that I will... I will cooperate in the sense that it would be harder on our system to undo Hamilton than to leave the system in place. And yes, of course, I have to reward people of my own party for offices, but I won't make a wholesale pogrom out of it. And don't you think that was certainly the case? Don't you think he probably did that expert politician thing where he said nothing but said a lot of words? And so everyone who kind of came out of the came out of the meeting would have felt that they heard what they wanted to hear, and he could in, say in good faith that he had promised nothing. That was re that's really my sense of Jefferson at this moment. That he gave everyone just enough to feel comfortable with the situation without actually ever saying anything. And of course, we aren't in these meetings, and there isn't really any documentation of those conversations and what they were what was said. But that's my read of how he would have operated in this moment. So I do think that that's right, that there was uh, there were hints and body language and a whole range of, of things that could be regarded by the Federalists as assurance. But the thing about it is, David, that there were 36 ballots in the House, and it became clear at some point that the Republicans, Jefferson's group, were never going to yield. There were 36 ballots in the House of Representatives, and each side stuck to its its system, and, and the Federalists couldn't win, and, and, the, and the Republicans couldn't win. It was an impasse that was going to go on and on. People slept in the House chambers. A sick man was brought on a litter. Food was brought into them. Exhaustion set in. There were rancorous arguments, but nobody was yielding. And so, Lindsay, it looks like this impasse would go on. And there were people who said, we're just going to have to have a president pro tem until we get this sorted out. Well, and the problem was that internally, initially among the Republicans, everyone had understood Jefferson was the president, Aaron Burr was the vice presidential candidate. But once it was a possibility that Burr could potentially be president, then he was no longer willing to abide by that internal agreement. And so he really wanted to be president. He was 
a very ambitious man. He saw this opportunity. And there were some New Englanders, some Northerners who thought, "Mm, this might be useful. This might be useful to us. Maybe Burr is someone we can work with more than Jefferson. And so you started to have these weird divisions where if Federalists couldn't get the candidate they wanted, then they were going to maybe think about who was the better person to support. And it ended up in gridlock for that many ballots. And who could, David, who could they deal with? So they thought they could probably deal with Burr because they reckoned that he was an opportunist who didn't have a very set um, principle about anything, that Jefferson was a true ideologue. And so... It, you're right. It was a prolonged agony. Lindsay, can you talk more about the support that Hamilton had? I mean, he and, and what role he played in all of this? He played a multifaceted role. So by this point, Hamilton was widely regarded as the leader of the high Federalists or the arch Federalists or the more extreme wing of the Federalist Party. He had been of course, Washington's right-hand man during the during the war. Then he had been Washington's Secretary of Treasury. He had been the mastermind behind the financial system, which had truly rebooted the economy and saved national credit. So he had proven to be a very wise and uh, prescient thinker about financial matters. When he left office, he continued to play a very ra- valuable role advising Washington. He was absolutely relentless in his capacity for work. So he continued to build political networks and offer advice and support. And the advice he gave to congressmen were was often treated as marching orders. So all through Adams' presidency, he was basically guiding at least a portion of the cabinet and a portion of the Federalists in Congress. And then he had been appointed as inspector general or the number two general in the new army, which was created in 1798. So he had been in charge of this huge uh, growing organization and able to appoint people, which was a huge opportunity for political connections and Uh, patronage. Now, he did have a number of sort of personal scandals, including the Reynolds pamphlet where he admitted to an extramarital affair, and he was very divisive. And then he published a pamphlet criticizing in very strong terms John Adams, the president of the United States, which had really fractured the Federalist Party. So he was never really going to run for office himself again and be a, a national figure in that way. But he had a huge cachet of authority and influence and power. And so one of the reasons that John Adams did come in third was because Hamilton was trying to split that vote. And then when it came time that Congress was gridlocked, the Federalists who were in Congress asked for his input and asked what they should do and asked how they should vote. And so even though he personally did not have a vote, he did have a lot of sway in how it ended up going. But if Hamilton had not written that 80-page pamphlet denouncing Adams and saying essentially he's unfit for the presidency, would Adams have won? No, I think three things caused Adams' loss. So the first was the split in the Federalist Party, which was exacerbated by that pamphlet, but was, I think, really uh, provoked by the dismissal of Timothy Pickering as Secretary of State. So the Federalists were not uh, united in the face of Jeffersonian opposition. That's number one. Number two were the ongoing peace negotiations with France. One of the best campaign issues for the Federalists had been a potential war with France because they were considered to be the more trustworthy party on military matters. And so if diplomacy was an option, they lost a lot of their credibility and Adams had been very pro-diplomacy. And third were the Alien and Sedition Acts. They were incredibly unpopular. They were a very easy cudgel that Jefferson was able to use and his supporters were able to use to beat the Federalists, and they caused a pretty big uh, backlash to a lot of Federalist policies. So I think those three things contributed to the loss. I do think had the Federalists not split, it would have been a much more interesting election. I'm not sure if this is an answerable question of it, but did the public uh, recognize all of these um, things that Hamilton had done regarding fiscal policy, or was this something that was just uh, recognized by the politicians of, uh, of the time. I mean, how much actual public support did Hamilton have? Less and less. It's a really interesting question, David, because how much how much of all the things we just talk about every week trickle down to people in 
Georgia or New Hampshire or Western Massachusetts is really an open question, although they were very literate and they realized something that of what was at stake. I think Hamilton, Lindsay, was well known for his fiscal work, that everyone kind of got that, that he was the genius behind the Bank of the United States and the assumption bills and so on, and that he had put us on a, on a good financial footing. Whether they knew much about the pamphlets and the, and the behind-the-scenes stuff is another kind of question. Uh, of course, people then and now love scandal, so surely they had heard something about the blackmail in the Reynolds affair. But, but here's my question for you, Lindsay. You could, of course, take up where David left off, too. But Hamilton actually, in some sense, delivered the presidency to Jefferson because he was in New York and people said, what shall we do? And everyone sort of expected him to say, I hate Jefferson so much, we'll have to accept Burr. But instead he said, Jefferson may be Jefferson, but he's we can deal with him. He's reliable. He's a statesman. He's 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 a good he's we however much we disagree on policy, he's one of us. And Burr is a, a kind of a, a floating opportunist who's a dangerous and possibly um demagogic figure. Is that your reading? It is. And I think had he made those allegations and there hadn't been some widespread basis for them, maybe that those words wouldn't have been so powerful. But Burr was very much an iconoclast in terms of his approach to politics. He was one of the first politicians to actually campaign. He took a very active role. And that was viewed with a little bit of raised eyebrows. That was not standard political behavior. It was not part of the political culture. And so people had good reason to think that he was ambitious and maybe more concerned with his own future than that of the nation. And so when Hamilton made these assertions, they kind of reaffirmed what people already sensed. And so I think that that was maybe the tipping point that confirmed, indeed, if someone like Hamilton, who dislikes Jefferson so much, is willing to say this, then this is something to we really need to grapple with. So Jefferson called the election of 1800 the second American revolution. How justified is that? You're gr- you're smiling. L- I can yes, see Lindsay smiling. rolling her eyes. No, I'm not rolling my eyes. I have a very complex answer, but I want to hear yours first. Well, yes and no. So yes, of course, it's the first transfer of power from one party of men to another party of men. It happened peacefully in spite of all the rhetoric. Uh, Jefferson really was a small d Democrat compared to the Federalists. He was a states' rights man. He wanted a lower tone for the presidency and for the national government. Uh, he was a man of peace. Uh, He believed in the good old principles of 1776. He was a visionary agrarian. Uh, Yes, in many respects, he, I won't say rescued the country, but turned it into a more small-R Republican direction. But no, if Jefferson had never been born, I think we would have evolved in much the way we have. What do you say, Lindsay? Well, on one hand, I think it was completely revolutionary. There had not been a peaceful transfer of power like this from one party to another in recent history. Really, it had hardly ever been done. Ever. Maybe a, you, there was a parallel in Greece or in Athens, but they knew how those republics had fallen. And so this was a revolutionary moment, and it was seen as a revolutionary moment around the globe. So it wasn't just Americans sort of patting themselves on the back. And yet at the same time, Jefferson changed actually relatively little. He used executive authority fully, just as Washington and Adams had done. He maintained the same cabinet structure that Washington and Adams had done. He maintained the fiscal system. He recognized that to destroy it would be incredibly damaging to the nation. He continued a lot of the same foreign policy. So there were things about his presidency that were really, in some ways, hardly a change at all. And yet the symbolic nature of it was indeed revolutionary. And then one thing he said in his address set the tone for what American politics was to become, and I think is revolutionary in its concept, which is we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. The idea- Actually, he said the other way around, of course, because- Naturally. Um, Of course. (laughs) Well, my brain is Federalist first, Republican I can second. see this. This is a Freudian moment again. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so we are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. But the idea behind that is that we settle our differences at the ballot box, and then we have this peaceful transfer of power. And that notion just cannot be celebrated enough. And he gave voice to it in a way that is very powerful. And here's the thing, David. David. 
from from 1800 on with very few tiny little blips it has it has occurred no matter how much uh, rancor and bitterness and and anger there is the outgoing president has yielded to the incoming president has attended the inauguration has conceded has understood that this is a this is kind of a sacred moment and it's a norm moment rather than a constitutionally required one it's a norm of civilized societies it's a norm of the dangerousness of transferring power, which usually involves bloodshed and chaos, as Margaret Bayard Smith famously said of this one. And now in 2000, for the first time, we have had a, a, an individual and part of a party who have said, sorry, we're not going to honor that norm. And that is so very dangerous, because if you look around, contested elections that end in violence have been the norm, including in our own time in the world. And so we, Lindsay, we thought this was settled. We thought that there would always be that, that that was one of the hallmarks of the American constitutional norms. And now we know it's a hallmark under terrible stress. One of the big themes that I'm working on in this book that I'm um, trying to finish as quickly as humanly possible is how much Americans took that for granted and Jefferson and Adams and Hamilton did not. And so they were very conscientious of how important these norms were to establish, how the American people had to be taught to cherish them, to celebrate them, to participate in them. And they were very careful that everything they did upheld those norms. Um, and the best thing we can do to celebrate their legacy is to try and give the same level of devotion to those norms that they did. Mm. So here we are. Distressing as it is, there is a minority, a growing minority of Americans who don't really care about that anymore. They would give up freedoms knowingly or unknowingly in order to have their candidate, their style of government, their beliefs represent them. Um, and it, it's pretty terrifying. Same thing happened in 1800 at a lesser scale. Hamilton actually wrote to Governor John Jay of New York suggesting after New York had voted that they change the system ex post facto so that uh, the, the, the Jefferson wouldn't win the electorals of New York. It, it, it's always been out there. And even people as great as Hamilton have been capable of succumbing to those passions from time to time. But you're absolutely right that, that this was, we thought this was settled and it's one of the, it's a sacred thing. And it reminds me that so much about our system, Lindsay, is not, spelled out in plain English in the Constitution. It requires a level of civic virtue, using the Roman sense of that, that isn't automatic. And we thought it was settled, but it's not settled because everybody has to agree to it. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so remarkable about this period that, that so fascinates me, and I suspect is the same for you, is that it was even more unsettled back then. It, because they didn't have centuries of precedent and norm to try and follow. And instead, we're doing the best that they could to try and fill out the fuzzy details and the, the, the silences in these documents and establish a practice that their successors could follow and, and to the best of their ability, doing really what they, you know, they could do to do that. And so to suggest that votes shouldn't count or an election should be by force there is nothing more un-American than that because that is a military dictatorship, that is a monarchy, that is authoritarianism and does not belong here. I want to thank the both of you for a great conversation this week. And uh, uh, Clay, give you an opportunity for the last word. We inevitably are talking about the current crisis because 1800 is an analogy that, that invites us to talk about the current crisis. Uh, you're right, David. We, people believe so profoundly now in the righteousness of their own tribe that they are willing to you know, put a match um, to the fuse of American self-destruction. And I never thought I'd see that day. I don't think, David, you ever thought you'd see that day. Lindsay, you know, we're talking about an unprecedented moment. So thank you, Lindsay. Let's do the alien and sedition laws and the uh, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions and so much more on our next installments of 10 Things. We get rave reviews for this, and they don't even get to see you roll your eyes. We'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education.
The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.